Everybody, please, in your so again, everybody, please sign in on the on the clipboard. We want to be able to to brag to our bosses about how many of you all showed up, so that then we can get like a budget for pizza or something. I shouldn't have said that, um, <laughs> but like let's assume hypothetically we can get a budget for something. Um, so everybody, please sign in and everybody point your browser to this website. It's called Colab, C-O-L-A-B, dot research, dot Google, dot com. I can, oh, I can do this. I can write it in big letters here. Colab, research, whoops. There we go, big letters. So please point your browser to this site. Um, I am going to assume none of you has ever used this before, and that's great. If you have never used this before, you're in exactly the right place. So OK, so I will explain what this website is in a second, but we'll start with doing this. So I'll, I'll do this slowly and multiple times. So you should get this pop-up right away. Yours may look a little bit different, but the idea is that it should have these tabs at the top. Is that right? OK, excellent. Um, you should also be logged into your Columbia account and whatever, but that's not actually super important. You want to click on the tab called GitHub. And then where it says, enter a GitHub URL or search by organization or user, you want to type in Columbia hyphen data hyphen club. And then uh, it should chill for a second. I don't know. OK, yeah, you have to click on the, on the magnifying glass. So again, when you open up colab.research.google.com, you get this pop-up, and you click on GitHub, and then you type in columbia-data-club. And then you click the, the magnifying glass. Then if you click on repository, you should see three options here. Despite the fact that this is intro to Python, you don't pick intro to data. You pick meetings. OK? And then you scroll down to please show up. Bingo. The very last one is 2023, 2023, blah, 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 blah. And just click on that. And then it might complain that this notebook was not authored by Google or by you or something along those lines. That's OK. Just say OK. And you should see this. Please raise your hand once you see this big picture. And like not by looking here. That's cheating. On your computer. Raise your hand if you see this picture on your, on your computer. For those of you, all right, Roger, can, is, OK, now let's do the opposite so it's easier to see people who are catching up. If you don't have this picture on your computer right now, Roger will help you get to it. I wish I could tell you how to get the puppy and cat running across. I don't remember how, how to do it. You can Google how to do it, but. It's a confusing building. It's the kind of building where you can get in the wrong elevator and not even know because it's on the wrong side of the hallway. Yes? Of course. Um, in fact, I'll do it once more. So the website is colab.research.google.com. Again, here it is in big letters. colab.research.google.com. And then as it loads, you should get this pop-up, whereupon you click on GitHub. 
then here you type in Columbia Data Club and with hyphens and click on the magnifying glass. Then you click here and pick Columbia Data Club Meetings. I now realize that this is way more steps than I thought in my head, but this is actually a very, e very good way of doing this, but I can't convince you of that today. And then you scroll all the way down to the bottom and pick the one that's called 2023, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Raise your hand if you do not have this big picture on your screen right now. That's the only way Roger will know to help you. So, okay. Luckily, um, the first couple parts of this, Roger can help out because we're not going to be doing any coding quite yet. Because I, I have a couple things that I want to complain about first. Um, so first thing is, in my opinion, there's no such thing as learning Python. A lot of people feel I've had students tell me that they want to learn Python for some reason. Um, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because, in my opinion, there are basically two ways to go about acquiring knowledge with regard to Python. You acquire specific knowledge about a specific library that helps you with a specific task, like building a website, making art, um, analyzing earthquake data. So you learn a specific library that helps you with that, and that's most of what we do in Data Club, is, is everything I was talking about earlier uh, that we're going to do this semester is of that ilk. We're going to be doing text analysis. We're going to be doing uh, exploratory data analysis, et cetera, et cetera. And then the other thing is Python is acquiring knowledge about Python in order to think about programming more generally. Everything in this notebook, this is called the notebook, everything that we're going to do today with very little um, like massaging can be done in a different language like JavaScript or Ruby or languages I don't know. Um, because the important thing to grasp is that this is conceptual and that it's a question of being able to solve problems. The specifics of the syntax are important to the degree that your program won't work if you have syntax errors. But you can have the most perfect syntax in the world, and if you don't understand conceptually what you're trying to do, it won't matter. So that's why when students come to me and they say something like, I need to learn Python, it's often because they're thinking in terms of, which is perfectly fine, they're thinking in terms of a career in data science, or they're thinking about something they want to put on their resume. And it's, I don't have firsthand experience with this, but I imagine it's much better to say not, I know Python, but to say, I know Pandas, which is the data science library I talked about. I've done blah, blah, blah kind of work with these and these libraries. Because that will let the potential um, job person, the hiring committee or whatever, get a sense of what part of Python do you know? Because no one knows all of it. And you can apply for a data science job and say, oh, I know Python. And all you've ever done with Python is make music with it. So, I mean, fair enough, you know Python, but it's not going to probably help you much in the data science job. So, yeah, so like I write here, programming languages are not very different from each other. As Roger will remind you, almost all programming languages are Turing complete, which means that any programming language can answer any of a set of problems, like the set of problems that exist in the world. If any programming language that's Turing complete can answer that problem, then all Turing complete languages can answer that problem. The issue is implementation, which is a detail. OK, um, but there are two good reasons that we are encouraging people to learn Python, as one can, which are allegedly it's easy to learn. I have no data on this. This is just what people tell me. But the code is generally readable. Um, it's nice and indented. There aren't a lot of curly thingies everywhere like there are in JavaScript or something like that. And similarly, again, tons of libraries that can satisfy a wide array of desires for your computational life. And here you can use it to 
analyze data, explore open quantum systems, transcribe audio interviews, make maps, model weather, design games, uh, gee, uh, talk to your refrigerator, edit movies, all kinds of stuff you can do with Python as the base. OK. I added a bunch of links to some resources. There's stuff here at Columbia. I mentioned Research Data Services already. In addition to Research Data Services, there's obviously Data Club. You are here. Thank you for coming. We have the Foundations for Research Computing that runs a um, intensive two-day workshop on Python um, twice a year, I think. Maybe more often in the future, but for now it's twice a year. The, those workshops, the, all of the code that's followed in those workshops is available online. Um, Software Carpentry is plotting and programming with Python. So you can take that on your own whenever you want. It's that, that link will take you to like a PowerPoint and whatever and that, that has notes and everything. And if you are an undergraduate or a student at SIPA, you can take Computing in Context which is a semester-long course on Python. OK. I also include a couple organizations um, and online resources for, learn for working with Python and, and getting a little bit more comfortable with it. Um, think Python is a free textbook that I think I mentioned twice in this. Yeah, I mentioned up here. This is ridiculous. But uh, Think Python is very much about how to think abstractly like a computer programmer, but we're just going to use Python as the implementation layer of these abstract ideas. Um, this author also has a class called something like Think Bayes, which does the same thing. It's, it teaches you how to reason abstractly about Bayesian statistical analysis, but just using Python as the implementation layer. OK. Oh my goodness. All right. So I called this a notebook. What is this you're using? Google Colab is an interactive notebook. If you've messed around with Python in the past, you may have used what's called a Jupyter notebook. Jupyter notebooks came first. The idea is more or less the same. The, everything here is editable by you. You can make changes. You can you know, do whatever you want in this notebook, because when you opened up that link, it made a copy of it in your Google Drive. So if I make changes here right now, you won't see them. So this is, uh, is both good and bad. But among the good things is you now have this in your Google Drive, and you can always go and open it up in the future, type things in, and mess around. So how do you make changes? Um, bum, 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 bum. You rather literally just click or double click. And what is this web page? with the cats you are using. And now it says, what is this web page with the cats you are using? So there, what this is, is it's a stack of cells. And each cell can do one of two things. It can hold Python code, or it can hold text written in Markdown, which I won't go into detail. This is a text cell. When I open it up, you can see the, the markdown version of what I write and then how it gets rendered here. And then if I click on, and I'll click on this in a second. Um, the code cells have this slightly darker gray background, and they have a play button, which means execute the code. So you can press this right now if you like. Oh, that's when it says this notebook was not authored by Google. Just say run anyway. You all trust me. Um, and then it's going, oh boy. And then hopefully, it will say underneath, hello from a code cell. Because there are so many of you, um, some of you may have trouble connecting to Colab. There's nothing really we can do about it. It's important that I maintain my connection so that we can keep things moving. Um, that's all. So you can press play. Additionally, and you can, you can immediately type, type stuff in here. Hello from a code cell to everyone at Data Club. And you can press play again, or you can just type shift return. 
and it'll, pl and it'll play it again. So that line, print, open parentheses, and then some text inside of double quotes, that's your first line of Python. It's a print statement, and we'll be seeing a lot of that this evening. Has anyone broken the notebook yet? I encourage you to, to try and break it. Um, we will, you will have opportunities to, to actively break it as we go down. Um, OK. So the next, the next step I uh, like to take is to talk about what are the fundamental building blocks when you are doing programming. So I talk about this again in the context of Python, but all of these building blocks exist in nearly any modern computer, uh, programming language. So these building blocks that we're going to talk about this evening are numbers, strings, booleans, functions, lists, or arrays in other languages, dictionaries or objects in other languages, and classes. Hopefully we'll get through all of them. The reason it's important to talk about these things is because these are, like I said, these are the fundamentals, the building blocks that you can then stack on top of the, each other and do things like make games or make art or analyze earthquake data. Numbers are numbers. They can be integers or non-integers. Python actually makes a distinction. But in, your, um, in the day-to-day -day of, of a Colab notebook, they don't matter too much. So if we press, press play here, we can see that it prints 7 star x, which means 7 times x. And the answer is 42. Um, the text that has a little octothorpe, or a hashtag, or a pound sign in front of it, and is green, those are commons. Anything that, start, that comes after that hashtag sign is completely ignored by the computer. That's there for you to add documentation or something along those lines. Um, and it's, it, Google Colab makes it dark green. Numbers are also dark green in Google Colab. That may be helpful. Um, print is a function, and it's this goldenish color. I don't know. So numbers, uh, so that's numbers. That's the whole story with numbers. But we can complicate things a little bit by creating variables, by defining a variable, and then assigning a value to that variable. And so instead of doing uh, 7 star 6, we can create a variable called, I should make this a little bit bigger, I think. There we go. We can create a variable called my number. So you just type my underscore number. There's a lot of flexibility with how you name variables in Python, but the Pythonic, the sort of idiomatic Python way of doing it is short words with all lowercase separated by underscores. So my underscore number equals 7. So now in the I memory of the computer, there is a thing called my number, and its value is 7. And when you do print my number star 3, you get, and press play, you should get 21. Or you can change my number to whatever you want, as long as it's a number still, and press play, and you'll get that. If you replace it with something else, you may get into trouble because it doesn't know how to multiply things. We'll get into that later. When you define and set a variable, when you assign a value to a variable like this, my number equals 7, you can refer to it in all of the cells. Once you run the cell where it's defined, you can then run other cells that also refer to it. So we're going to be doing this uh, for, the, for the rest of this time. So try to keep pressing play, because otherwise you may get an error down the line when it's looking for a variable that you never actually initialized. So because I set my number equals 7 up here, when I press play here, I get my number plus 2, which is 9. So that's variable assignment and numbers as a data type. We're moving fast here. The next data type are strings. Strings are strings of alphanumeric characters, uh, which is to say letters, numbers, punctuation, emoji. Uh, that are surrounded by quotes. Uh, when you did print hello from the collab or whatever it was at the beginning, you saw that there were the quotes, and it made the, the whatever was inside the quotes was red. 
That meant, means it's a string. Colab colors strings in red. Not all notebook thingies do the same color scheme, but in Colab, strings are red. So you, I define a variable here, my string equals hello, how are you, with an emoji. And then you can see that you can do some math on strings too, but the results may be a little bit uh, unexpected. Or I don't know. Yes, if you do, so you're saying here this line, my string plus two without the quotes. Yeah, it crashes because uh, putting two in, this is a more complicated example than I intended now in retrospect, but life goes on. Because two is in quotes and it's colored red, that means it's a string. So adding two strings together just smushes them together. When it doesn't have the quotes and it's green, it's a number, you can't really add a number to a string. You can in JavaScript, but that's a different story. Um, so it just crashes. It doesn't know what to do. So as of a few years ago, uh, whenever Python 3.6 came out, you can use f strings to interpolate variables that you have defined into a string. So this is a little bit like using a mail merge. If you've ever had the unfortune of having to do a mail merge, then you know you like have a little place for dear blah, blah, blah. Sorry, we can't accept you into our PhD program. We had many more applicants than normal, da, 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 da. So that uh, dear name is interpolating a variable from some data source into the, uh, into the email. So the example that we have here is I said my name is Moisir. My greeting is F. You have to start an F string with the letter F. Hello, my name, and I surrounded my name with braces. That's these little things, I call them braces. And then if you do print here, you see with the F, it interpolates the value of the variable my name. And without the F, it just prints my name in braces. So we'll be playing with this a lot uh, as we move on. So we're really smoking now. So now we've got strings. We've got string interpolation, which again is a kind of new feature. I think it's like five years old only. Python, I think, was, came out in the early 90s. And it took them this long to get useful string interpolation. Booleans. There are two values for Booleans, true and false. Capital matters. Capital T, true. Capital F, false. It's a little weird to assign that value to a variable, like my truth equals true. Um, but what you do use Booleans for is you can write tests for them, where it evaluates something and tells you whether that thing is true or false. And you can imagine that that comes in handy when you're trying to do conditionals. If something is greater than something else, do something. If something is equal to something, do something else. So here we have, we're making use of these um, uh, comparison operators. A double equal sign means equals to. Uh, then the next one is less than or equal to. And then we just do double equals again. So if you press play, it says my number is seven. Is my number equal to two? False. Is my number less than or equal to 100? True. Is my number equal to a number? False. And you'll see there on the last one, I switched to single quotes. Um, I'm asking rhetorically there why, but I'll give you the answer. The reason why is because I'm using double quotes inside the string. So I just start with single quotes instead. Python actually doesn't make it, doesn't care which you use. So, you know, have fun, be expressive, use whatever you want. I typically use double quotes because then I don't have to worry about apostrophes. But if you're going to be using double quotes, then you should use single quotes. There are ways around this, but it, it's not, we don't have, we don't have to get into it today. Yes, well, you can, you can try this if you, or I can, show, um, I can show everyone here what happens. So if I go here and I have this in single quotes now, 
and I replace it with a double quote, and then I replace this with a double quote, you see that now it's, uh, it's colored funny. A number is now black. And if I run, crash, because this is, it doesn't make any sense. So what using a single quote here does is I know I can start the string with a single quote because I know there won't be a single quote inside. And the opposite is true. If I'm writing something with apostrophes in it, then I'll start with double quotes. OK. So these are sort of the three um, basic, is it three? Numbers, strings, booleans. The three basic data types that are sort of stable atomic entities in Python. Now we're going to get interactive. So the next level up are functions. I said already that print is a function. Functions tend to look like a short little word or a couple words with underscores with parentheses. And functions are kind of like the verbs. They, expect, they exist there to do stuff to stuff that you give to them. And I know it's a little bit confusing to say like they do stuff to stuff you give to them, but that's the point. They can do anything to anything. You just have to lead the way when you're writing your function. So what goes inside the parentheses, like in print, parentheses, blah, 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 is what's called a parameter or an argument. You can use those more or less interchangeably. And when we did print the string, the argument was that string. And the idea is, please print this text or this string. Um, another built-in function is the len function, which tells you the length of something but only if something has a conceivable length. So a string has a conceivable length. Um, it's technically called sized, I think. So it has a conceivable length. So if you do len on a string, it'll tell you how many letters long it is. If you do len on a number, it'll be like, no, that doesn't make any sense. What does it mean for 42 to have a length? So if you press play here, um, oh, let me actually walk through this code. So if you do print f my name is len my name, then it should tell you how long your name is. Because your name is a string, and so it has a length as a result. But then we can write our own function that does something similar. And the way you write a function, this is the first real big weird thing about Python that I've talked about so far. Python, in Python, white space matters sometimes. So how far away your code is indented matters. Because the idea is that when you open up, when you start a definition of a function, for example, then the whole definition of the function has to be indented one level. Um, you can tab it. You can uh, double space you, or tap space twice. It just has to be consistent. Because when that indent changes, it either thinks that you're starting a new thing even deeper in there. Oh, and by the way, you need the colon too. So colon and then an indent. So I'm creating a function here called how long is a word. And I'm passing a value to it called word, a parameter called word. And then I print a little line. Your word word is len word letters long. And, but the indent is important. So if you were trying, this is a very common mistake, uh, a very easy thing to get caught up on because, I mean, spaces are spaces. It's very easy to forget them. So if any of you have any experience with Python, most likely you've had index or indent errors before um, from stuff being indented incorrectly. So as you can see here, I, def I set up the line to define the function, colon, indent. There's only two lines in this function. One is a comment, so it's ignored. And then the rest is do this printing thing. So again, when I said do something to something. So I take an arbitrary parameter, an arbitrary argument, and I do stuff with it. And then I call the function. Once I've defined it, I've created this function called how long is a word. And then in this last line, I can call it. I'm going super fast, I'm realizing. 
but hopefully it's okay. It's all recorded, and you have these, this notebook anyway, and pressing play, all the code should work. So it's, it's the important intuition here is what a function is. It's something that does something to something, and that you have to do these indentations whenever you are nesting uh, code inside of other code. So a function has code inside of it that it abstracts out, so you only have to call the function as opposed to calling all the other stuff. OK. The indentation is also used with conditional statements and with loops. It's counting states as well, right? When you say six? Yes, it will also count, as count spaces. Yeah. Yeah, these, these examples are um, uh, very brittle. Um, because the, the goal is to keep things moving and to keep things short and legible. But yes, you're right. If you have a name uh, made up of multiple words and you actually only want to know the letters, it is possible to do that. It's just you have to add a couple extra lines of code. You can strip out the space characters. Um, there's things you can do. Um, conditional statements, if statements, and loops also use this indented syntax. You do a test if something is true or not, colon, indent, do what happens if it's true. And uh, one of my favorite, hi, it's my first 90 minutes of programming examples is to write a tip calculator. You already know enough um, Python slash programming to write a tip calculator in Python. I won't ask you to do it right now. Instead, I'll give you the answer right here. And, but I also want to point out that you could write it any way you want to. I made certain assumptions here. For example, if the service is good, you tip 20%. If the service is bad, you tip 18%. Your ideology may be different, and you may want to rewrite your tip calculator where it never gives a tip. That's up to you, and that can be a challenge for yourself. Or you can write it so that no matter how good or bad or whatever the bill is, the tip is always $20. You can write a little thing that just does that. So I'll walk through this code. So it, you get two parameters here. In the previous function, how long is a word, we had just the one parameter. Here we have two, total, which is the, your bill at the restaurant. And then the second parameter is called good underscore service. And it says good underscore service equals true there because that's the default value. You can change it to false. And by default, your function will assume that the service was bad. This is, again, up to you. The point is to, is to demonstrate how expressive and how quickly you can, you can do whatever you want, basically, once you have these basic fundamentals in place. So I said if statements also have a colon, and then they have the indent. If good service, which is to say if good service is true, colon, indent, create a new variable called total with tip and make it equal to 1.2 times total, which is to say that the total with the tip is 120%, or the total plus 20% a 20 tip. Else, so if good service is not true, else colon indent, make total with tip equal to 1.18 times total. So the important intuition here is to see that if is followed by a test, such as good service, because we set good service to true or false. Um, you could also, I think, do something like equals true. I'm pretty sure that would work also, and that's a little bit more um, readable, perhaps, um, but also perhaps a little bit redundant. And you get this. Then you can have a couple blanks. And then at the bottom, it says return total with tip. Return is the output, what the function spits out. In the previous functions, they didn't have a return value. They just called print, which is a sort of void. It just does stuff. Whereas now, we are returning a concrete value that you can then work with. And you can see what I do here. Print UO tip calculator 20 good service equals false then I can skip the good service, and it'll set it to true by default. 
and then I can do UO tip calculator 20 true. And then we can use variables in the functions as well. So you can set a my total is $40. My service is equal to 20 greater than 10. That's a really contrived example of true because 20 is greater than 10. So my service equals 20 greater than 10 is, like I said, a contrived way of saying my service equals true. And then if you do my total with tip equals tip calculator my total good service, what that does is it fills my total with tip with the return value of the function. Because remember, that this function, unlike the functions that end in print or the print function itself, spits something out. It has an output. It has a return value. And that, in this case, that return value is your total with the tip. So then at the, at the bottom, you can just print IO my total with tip instead of my IO tip calculator 40 good service, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so again, the expressivity, the potential for getting yourself into trouble extremely quickly should be somewhat apparent. But it also should be apparent that you can change this sort of stuff around uh, as you like and do different things. Um, like this is a very, very simple function. Or let me rephrase that. This function doesn't do a lot. It tests to see if the service is good or not. And based on that, it, give, it does a little bit of math. But you can see how functions can start to do a whole lot more. OK. Um, Go ahead. Um, if I'm writing f in front of print, then it should not print because it's a function? Um, OK. That's, that's a good question. This is so that. That f in front of the string mm -hmm. turns a regular string into what's called an f string. I'm pretty sure f string, other than sounding like something on a guitar, is short for format string. So when you have the f there, you can add the variable interpolation in the braces. Like the, sorry, we couldn't accept you to the PhD program email, right? Without that f, it'll just print the brace. It won't fill in the value of that computation that's done inside those braces. Um, so that's what that f does. It, it print is the function here. I don't know how to describe under the hood, because I don't know, what precisely the f is doing. But the f is doing stuff on the string. So it is not wrong to think of it as a function. But the syntax is, all wrong, is, is wrong, so it's probably better just to think of the f as a separate little thing that starts off a string in a certain way. OK. Let's keep things moving. How am I doing for time? Oh, I've got plenty of time. Oh, yes, go ahead. In the second print line, you didn't say if it's true or false, we just assume that it's true. Correct. That's because when I defined the function, I gave a default value for good service. It assumes that it's true. If you change this true to false and reran the cell, and then, it's okay. then it would assume that the service is false by default. It's, um, yeah. So. If the reason how long is a word works is because the one line of code that it does is to print something. If you get rid of this, um, I mean, maybe this is, is helpful to look at. If I get rid of this and I press play, then it doesn't do anything because it's print at least prints something to the screen. What I'm doing here is I'm just executing code into the void. It's not doing anything. However, no, I'm asking oh, for the line behind here. 
this Yes, so I define this function, how long is a word, and then I call it call. here. So, it's, so calling is also when I'm playing, it will print it down. Yes, so the, one of the reasons you use a function is because it, it helps you um, encapsulate a specific concern. You want to do something specific, and so you put it into a function so that it, it does its whole little thing inside of itself. Um, this can get very monadic. And then it just gives you an output. It becomes a little bit like a black box. You just want to make sure that given a certain input, you get the right output. So how, how it actually does it is, is up to you, more or less. Yeah, I understand. Uh, under def, if I'm writing print, it is not going to print, actually. And uh, if, you, if you write. Um, If you write this, then it will, it will print that, and it will only print that. Here's a thing to print. Um, and that's, that's because print, no matter what, will, in, a observable, uh, in a collab notebook, will spit something out into the bottom. Because this is, this is sort of the weird thing where it, it just prints, like it sort of hijacks the way the code is working to just spit information out. Um, I would typically not use print as much as I'm using it in this workshop, probably. I don't know, Roger, how often do you use print? Only when things break. Yeah, it's very useful for when things break. Um, but on a day-to-day on a -day basis, you don't, you don't want to use it because usually when you're writing functions and stuff like that, you're very interested in the output, you're, which, is, which is different than what it prints to the screen. What it prints to the screen is a specific kind of message that you, you spit out using the print function. But the output, the return value, is often what you are very interested in. So that's why it's, 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 it's good to sort of show functions with the print function in it, because it lets you see very quickly what happens. But the real power comes when you start using, um, uh, using functions where you are relying on specific inputs and outputs, as opposed to just what shows up on the screen. I don't think I have a very good example of that, but the tip calculator is kind of a good example because we, like you can see, inside this is the entire definition of the tip calculator function. There's no print in it, right? Because what we do is we just print and we just say, give me the return value and print the return value. And that's just to keep things moving, right? So yeah, this is, this is good, because it's, it's, it, is, it is a conceptually peculiar thing, that there's a difference between broadcasting a message to the web page, to the notebook, and actually working with values. OK, so functions are tricky. Uh, we can dial it back a little bit and move to lists. Lists are called arrays in other languages. Um, and they are exactly what they sound like. They are lists of things. And a thing can be probably anything. Um, so you can make a list of numbers, a list of strings, a list of booleans. Uh, Pandas actually relies on effectively lists of booleans to do a lot of the work that it does. Um, you can make lists of numbers and booleans and strings and functions and other lists and everything we'll be talking about you can put into a list. The way you make a list is you write your things separated by commas and then you surround it in brackets. And again, my language is vague here because that's how flexible it is. It's not like a vector where a vector has to have, you know, it has to be all numbers or whatever, and, and it has to be a certain length, or not a certain length, what's the magnitude? A certain number of, a certain number of terms. Um, what's that? I don't, I don't, shape, shape is one way of, of, of thinking about it. But yeah, like, um, lists, you can do whatever you want to with them. They just have to be in brackets. In lists, order matters. The, the order you put the things in is how you then refer to the things in the list. 
it is possible to change the order, etc. But that doesn't change the fact that the order matters. And the reason the order matters is because the way you refer to members of a list, that's what they're called, members, the way you refer to members of a list is by an index value. So, and to add a little bit of confusion, indexes start at zero. So you may think, oh, this is the first member of a list. You can say that if you want. Pedagogically, I always say this is the zeroth member of the list, just because it sounds so weird that it reminds everyone that its index value is zero. So you have the, the first one is the zeroth, then you have the oneth member of the list, then you have the toothth member of the list, then the threeth, then it's fourth, fifth, etc. Five, I guess. Um, just to sort of keep this in mind. And the reason that the, the way that shows up is here in this code, I create two lists here, my list and my list of numbers. So you can see my list has a variable that happens to be assigned to a string. Um, oh, and it even tells me that here. Um, eventually, I'll get to all the little help features that Colab has that help, help move things, things, these things along. But my list has four members. The first is a variable that's assigned to a string. The second is an integer. The third is another string. And the fourth is a float, which is a non-integer number. My list of numbers is all numbers, with all integers except one float. Now, if I do print my list 0 in brackets, I get the zeroth value of the list. So this is why order matters, because there is only one thing in that list has an index of 0, and it's the value for my name. Also, if I do minus 1, I get the last member of the list. So if you press play here, this shows you how you initialize a list. It's just stuff with commas surrounded by brackets. And then you refer to something in the list by using the name of the list, my list, and then the index value as a number inside brackets. So it's, there's always brackets going on with lists. OK? Ah, uh, sure you can. It just looks a little funny. Yeah. Um, again, I'm mostly using print here for illustrative purposes. Uh, being able to print a, a member of a list is not is in the long run, not very helpful. But being able to access members of a list is extremely powerful. And if you do anything data related, um, you will find yourself, I guarantee, iterating over lists. You will have, here are a list of um, my patients uh, in this clinical study I'm doing. Here are a list of um, you know, Pokemon I'm, I'm uh, farming. Here are a list of my favorite uh, burrito recipes. And, and you'll want to iterate over them and do things like say, show me all the burrito recipes that require guacamole. Show me all the Pokemon that have reached level three. Show me all the um, patients who are in the control group or something. I don't know. I don't know how clinical trials work. So this point of iteration is that you start moving over these lists to accumulate information about what it is you're working with. This is exceptionally powerful and requires a little bit. This is, this is when I've taught programming formally. This is often a big conceptual leap, how to go from thinking of a list as a collection of things with brackets around it to something that you can actually move over, like a train rolling down a track. OK, lists have lengths. And then you can iterate over a list, so what I was just talking about, using a for loop. So this is, I'll just press play here, and then I'll talk about what's happening here. Because this is really, this is where the conceptual issues st start showing up in my experience. So this line, for element in my list of numbers. 
So in our head, we have this, you know, we've made this list called my list of numbers that's, I don't know, five, six numbers long. And then we say for element. What that means is iterate over the list. So the list is, we actually know it's six long. So move through the list six times. And every time you move through the list, take that current value of the list. So you start with three and assign that to the arbitrary variable element in this example for element in my list of numbers. Okay, so the first time through the loop, element equals three. The second time through the loop, element equals five. The third time through the loop, two, et cetera, et cetera. And then when you are looping through it, do something with that value. And I just said print that value times 2.1. It's totally whatever. You can do whatever you want. I just had to do that. And you can see what happens here is it takes each value multi in that list, so all six of those values, and step by step multiplies each of them by 2.1 and then prints the value. Um, I can show you in a second. There's a very idiomatic, I think this is, this is tricky because I have to remember if, if this works this way in Python or not. Um, but that's, so this kind of iteration, this for loop, what this is, what's being done here is called a map. What you're asking about is called a filter, which filters a list and says only show me the burrito recipes that have guacamole in them, that sort of thing. Um, filters are done a little bit differently. Um, well, there's one thing we can do. We can do this. If element greater than, you said four? Yep. So if element greater than four, let's do greater than equal because I don't know, I can't remember what numbers I made up there. And then you can actually already see there's a little squiggle maybe tricky for you all to see here. There's a little squiggle under print because I didn't indent. So the, the Colab notebook is already telling me, hey, there's a mistake here. Don't press play. It'll, well, it'll crash. And I'll press play anyway because YOLO. And we get an indentation error, which is the exact error I said that you would get um, once you start writing a lot of Python. So instead, we do tab. The little squiggle goes away. I press play, and now it only prints the for the three numbers that are greater than four or equal to four. Similarly, you could change around the order of things here and do a little bit of variable assignment and do something like only print the value if element times 2.1 is greater than four. Like, the world is your oyster, and this is really what I'm trying to, trying to uh, push forward here. Um, so yeah, so that's one way of doing the filtering. If you tried to do this in JavaScript, it would work not the same way, but that doesn't matter. Okay, the other way of doing what you asked about, and this is a very Pythonic thing, and once you've mastered this, which I have not, then you really understand conceptually what it means to iterate. This is called a list comprehension, and what it does is you create a new list called my list of squared numbers, and then the syntax you use is, is this wild thing, n times n for n in my list of numbers. So what this is doing is it's saying for n in my list of numbers, and that n is an arbitrary name of a variable. I could have called that, that burrito. I could have called it element. I could have called it whatever I wanted to. I picked n because this line was already getting long, and I, and I only use this variable in this line of code. So I don't have to remember what it means, because it's only used here. So that for n in my list of numbers is the same conceptually as for element in my list of numbers, but then I just precede it with n x n. So I can retype this.
this isn't entirely true, but this for n in my list of numbers, print n x n, is effectively the same thing as my list of squared numbers equals this thing, and then print my list of squared numbers. This is, again, um, this is very idiomatic Python, but also very hard to wrap your head around, especially if this is the first time you're ever seeing it. Do you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. In the original list. Yeah, great, great question. Yeah, that's the beauty of this, is that it's, it's non-destructive. When, when you're doing these sorts of things, you're just saying create a new list. You know, lists are free, basically. You can create as many lists as you want. So you have your original list, your original data set of, of patients in your clinical trial, and then you do transformations on that data. OK, filter out everyone who was in the control group. OK, um, uh, take everyone's address and obscure it you know, so that people can't you know, to de-identify the data. Then do this, then do this, then do, then do this. And you're doing all this powerful work that helps with your analysis while never actually changing the original data. And then on top of it, this is why these notebooks are so popular, is because it's completely reproducible. Because you start with reading this data set from somewhere, either you upload it or something like that. And then from there, do all these transformations, all this wrangling on that data set to get an answer at the bottom. And it will always be the same, no matter, no matter what the, um, uh, you know, no matter what computer you're running on or anything like that. That's effectively true. It's not actually true. Okay, so the iterable nature of lists is their uh, secret power. And then we'll move to um, the second to last type, which are dictionaries. Dictionaries are things that have properties. Um, I created four dictionaries. Um, they may be familiar to you. You'll have, to, you'll have to tell me if they're familiar or not. And um, a dictionary is defined by a set of key value pairs where the key is a string in quotes, then a colon, then the value associated with that key. And that's a, uh, with delineated by commas, surrounded by braces. So these are long definitions. So that's why I have all these returns here to make it a little bit more readable. Um, but, right, so there are these four dictionaries, Raphael, Leonardo, Donatello, and Michelangelo. And each of, yeah, go ahead, sure. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's exactly the conceptual leap. And it's, it's, um, um, Element just stands in for whatever the current value in the current step in the list you're going through is. So if I were to create a loop um, on my list, the first time through, element equals the variable my name. Whatever my name is assigned to at that time, that's the same thing as element. The second time through the loop, element equals two. The third time through the loop, element equals the string tree. And the fourth time through the loop, element equals 82.4. The way it knows, there's, the way it knows is because lists are created in a specific way so that when you say for something in a list, it automatically does this thing where it steps through it step by step by step by step. So element is different every time. And that's why it's important to say that it's like all, all variables in programming are conceptual. Like they, you can name them whatever you want. You can do whatever you want with them. You can typically, um, in Python, you can have, a ver have my name equal two. Then you can change it and say, well, actually, now my name equals this function. And then say, now my name equals Moisir. Then my name equals a list. You can even change what my name points at 
as much as you want. It's very flexible. But, and so that's why element, it, I just used element as a word there. You need some kind of thing to refer to what you're iterating, what the current value at the current step in the list you are in is. And that's like, um, you know, that's, that's why I said this is, I haven't figured out how to describe this yet. But that's, that's the conceptual thing. Like the more you start using lists and, and doing loops and iterating, the clearer this sort of thing starts to become. Um, because, and, and it reaches a point where you don't even think about it. And actually, like that, the N that I used um, in the list comprehension, like you, want, you start understanding it that it's so abstract, you don't even need a real word for it, a, a real name for it, because that N exists only in that line of code. It says, loop through this, create every, inst uh, create every step, call it N, then do some stuff on it, and then we're done. We're out. We're never going to refer to that n again. And if we do, it'll be in another loop where we can call it n, we can call it element, we can call it burrito, we can call it whatever we want. But yeah, so that's that's that's. Um, it takes it takes a certain amount of abstraction, um, that, I think mostly just comes with practice. Um, but yeah, but it's it's. Definitely, that's a question to keep asking until, until it clicks. Someday, I hope it clicks for everyone. That's my gambit, is that everyone can, can eventually see this. OK, so back to the dictionaries. So we have these four dictionaries, Rafael, Leonardo, Donatello, and Michelangelo. They all have properties. Um, they have a name property, an alias that's a string. They have an aliases property that's a list of strings, a height property that's a um, non-integer number, a float, a weight property that's a um, an integer, and so on. And then I can once I name once I assign all of these dictionaries, I can create a new list called turtles, and just feed the four variables into it. Okay, so I I I'm not sure I've been pressing play for everything, but this is going to be important to press play here. Okay. We're almost done. It's the second to last thing. And then it's just to show that you can do, you can also iterate then over turtles. So this is the same thing for turtle in turtles. Turtle is just an abstract variable name that I picked because conceptually I know that this list is a list of turtles. So I say for turtle in turtles, print blah, 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 blah. And we get turtle, then in brackets, name. So print the name property is turtle, print the height property, meters tall. And his primary weapon is turtle. And this is, this is tricky. Print the turtle weapons property, the zeroth index, because weapons is a list. So the, the first thing in the list, and then the weapons are all capitalized, so then I do this. I add this thing at the end, which is a method, which we'll learn about in like three minutes, to lowercase it, dot lower. So that's why, if you look here, you know, bo staff is capital B O staff, but down here it's a little b. So that's a lot. But the the idea is, but now. And the point of the dictionaries is that they can hold specific kind of data that's predictable. So now you can start to kind of see how you can think of a data set as a list of dictionaries. So back to the clinical trial. Every patient you can think of as a dictionary that has a name, that has, I don't know, a, a date of birth, um, a height and a weight, um, what group they're in, um, other kinds of identifying or non-identifying information, et cetera, can each be a parameter. And that then you can use, you can access just the parameters you need at any given time and work with it. Now, doing it this way is a little bit cumbersome. So that's why the next step and the last step here, yes? Yeah, in this one, the 
Oh, oh, that's a mistake, actually. Yeah, but it's not, it has not. It, it right. Um, it just runs them together as one thing. It Thanks. Know that well, it doesn't know that there are two. It thinks they're just one, and it's just one string that's broken up into two pieces. I thought I, I had that mistake elsewhere here, but I didn't, I clearly didn't fix it. But okay. Um, so yeah, so if we did nickname or aliases, and I asked for um, the zeroth alias, then it would have printed both of those, smushed together. Okay, so to finish um, this, this section of going through these types, the abstract um, pro version of doing this kind of work with dictionaries is what are called classes. So if you have any experience with object-oriented programming, you'll be very familiar with classes. Um, what a class is, basically, is a pattern that you define ahead of time for what something like a dictionary should look like. It's much more flexible than that. Give me a second. It's much more flexible than that and much more powerful than that, but that's a good entryway into thinking about it. Yes? What's that? Yeah. Sure, sure. So, sort of. So let's, um, so I didn't say how to do this, but you can add in an arbitrary code block or an arbitrary text block wherever you want just by hovering your mouse kind of over the middle here. And so I'm going to hover my mouse here and click on code. And now I get this blank cell here. And so I'm going to print turtles. And you're going to see how it looks. So you get, you know, just this, right? Which, again, using print is a little bit weird because it, it's not as val it's, it's valuable for demonstration purposes, but not for actual computational purposes. So however, you can imagine something, and actually we will do this in, at, at the very, very end, um, creating a text document that has this information in it. So if we just print this, this is just the raw data, as it were. I want to finesse it a little bit. I want only certain parts of that data. I want to do some changes to the data, et cetera, et cetera. How am I do? Oh, I'm almost. I have to. I have to finish up. Okay. So the class. Um, I'm going to move through this really quickly. But a class, like I said, is a kind of default blueprint for a sort of souped-up dictionary. So every class has an init function with these double underscores. And you can set properties, name, aliases, weapons, occupation, height, weight, bandana, same as we did for the dictionaries. And then you can also add other things. Like, for example, the Ninja Turtle class has two little functions here called height in inches and BMI. So the dictionary just has strings and lists and numbers in it. The class has these functions as part of the template. Functions that are part of a class are called methods, and you refer to them by doing dot the method name. And you'll see this right below here. So in this, so I should press play so nothing crashes. And these are just a couple different ways of setting the um, and I'll add that comma because it's missing here too because I copy pasted. Um, different ways of setting, um, doing the same thing with the dictionaries, but instead creating what are called class instances. So now there's something uh, gluing these four turtles together. They all have a similar data structure that's predictable ahead of time. And one of the things we can do is then do four turtle and turtles turtle.names BMI is turtle.bmi. Oops. I didn't run this cell. What did I do wrong?
There we go. And it, BMI is something that is calculated on the fly based on other parameters in the class. So the height, height and weight is the function. And then you can do the same thing to do a conversion. You can print out the turtle's uh, height in inches. So uh, at home, you can look at these little functions, and you can see that height in inches just takes the height parameter called self.height, or the property height, and multiplies it by 39.37, which is how you convert from meters to inches. And BMI just returns self.weight, which is the weight parameter, divided by self.height squared. OK, so um, as a last thing, um, things get especially complicated here. But then at the very end, we have writing to files. And this I just wanted to quickly show. Hopefully, this will work. What this does, Colab has these funny things. You've seen um, it, it gives you inline help sometimes if it can. Um, but it also has a little, uh, it has these little helpers on the side here. So this x in braces will give you a list of all the current variables you have in, in the notebook, which can be useful. Because it, it, or it can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. The uh, files shows um, you can upload files to this area and then read them in in, in the Colab notebook. Roger might be doing that uh, in, the, in the Pandas workshop in two weeks, not to put you on the spot. Um, yeah. <laughs> or you can write files from, the, um, from the, the notebook to, your, to this space. So this, this uh, function that I, that, or this with uh, loop, that I did here with open a file called height and weapon secrets.txt. Then for turtle and turtles, write this line of text. And we get this file here that gets created. And it's a little um, text file. I'll close this so you can actually see it. That has the information printed into it. Print is the wrong word. Written into it. Because I didn't use print. If you look here, I use the write method on the file object, which is a lot. But I don't print to the file. I write to it. And so you get this text file that you can download. And you can send it to Shredder so he knows um, how to attack the turtles. And that's it. There's a conclusion there. But just to say, really, the point here is to show you that hopefully this isn't impossible. I moved extremely quickly here. Um, and uh, abstracted away a whole lot of stuff. But hopefully, this is enough to sort of make the notebook environment a little bit familiar to you and to get the basic concepts down so that you feel confident maybe looking, at, looking over this on your own time for Roger's um, step up in two weeks. That's it. Baby step up, yeah. Definitely come back. It'll be slow uh, enough for y'all um, and fast enough for it to be exciting, but not overwhelming. 